What does organic actually mean? Me as a producer, the focus is to do it in the, the most natural way possible. The places in the world that are going to experience the most population growth are the ones who can least afford to have more, they, they just don't have the arable land to, to, to grow more food. Over the last two or three years, I've sort of done a deep dive into Canada's farming and how we grow things, and I have definitely changed my tune a little bit. It's just so not complicated if you just appreciate a good meal. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Semkew. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Semkew. Food has become an ideological battleground, and there are all kinds of schools of thought, from organic versus non-organic, to local versus imported, and the list goes on. Trusted nutrition information is hard to find, with almost daily reports in the media offering conflicting messages about what to eat and what to avoid. And it's not just what you eat, it's also how it's produced that matters. Is it environmental? Is it sustainable? Just what are genetically engineered foods, and who is eating them? What do we know about their benefits and their risks. Today's show tries to answer those questions, but before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. A hundred years ago, over half of Canada's population farmed. Today, that number is less than 2%. So, with how removed we are from our food, it's no wonder Canada's organic sector has grown from a niche market to big business. Today, it's worth an estimated $4.4 billion. And since 2001, the number of organic farms has increased by a whopping 66%. Fruits and vegetables are the cornerstone of this market, with over half a billion in sales last year. 66% of Canadian shoppers purchase organics weekly, up 10 points from 2016. And millennials are leading the charge, with 83% buying into the organics movement, the highest of any generation. But despite all this, the organic sector is still a small slice of the agricultural pie. Okay, so why don't we get started? We'll start by defining maybe some of these key buzzwords, Brad. What is organic? Now, you're the head chef of an organic restaurant, That's, I understand. Yeah, it's organic, but I mean, it's, it's also the buzzword that most people understand better. Really what I do is I deal directly with farmers and look at their process. Organic is about soil, but I also want to see that they're treating the workers properly. Now, I've always understood organic to mean free of pesticides. So I was surfing the USDA website the other day, and it had a long list of approved pesticides that are able to be used in organic food. So what's that about? What's that about? It's about... <laughs> Um, Does that mean that there are pesticides in organic foods? For sure. To your point, organics. When we reach for organics in the uh, grocery stores, most of us think that we're reaching for something that's nutritionally superior or that it's going to be grown in a way that's much safer for us. And that's actually not the truth. So I think people need to have a deeper understanding of how organics are grown and what actually is put on organics as opposed to just thinking or feeling that it's a better way to eat. But there are, you know, when you look on these websites, there are a list of approved pesticides for organics, but there's a longer list of approved pesticides for non-organics. And pesticides right. is a pejorative word. I mean, I don't like eating pesticides. Right, but there are standards for how much pesticide residue can be left on fruits and vegetables, whether it's organic or whether it's conventional. And both, both those numbers are completely safe numbers. Mm. Well, hi -ho. <laughs> no, and, and Health Canada does regulate and Food Inspection Agency regulates all aspects of this. And so whether you've got a long list or a short list, all those products have gone through a rigorous assessment to determine whether they're safe or not to be used. And this process doesn't happen overnight. For a synthetic chemistry to go from start to finish, it takes about 10 years. <laughs> I, I'm really intrigued by, the, by Brad's definition of organic, and it's all about the soil. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't disagree that the soil is an important part of organic, but that's his definition, and, and that definition varies from place to place. And uh, so, so maybe the first step of this is to determine what, what does organic actually mean. 
And so for me as a producer, the focus is to do it in the, the most natural way possible. The term natural is like a bombshell too. It's like yeah. natural, healthy. Those Tough terms one. are very gray terms, right? Well, it's not definitive. For complete, you know, just the complexity goes. You don't just plant something and then maybe use a pesticide. You typically, if you're talking about a genetically modified seed, it also comes with an inoculant. You usually spray the field first to kill any, you know, any herbs in the field and then you plant with the inoculant and then you hit it with fertilizers and then through the cycle there are herbicides as well as pesticides. And by the time you're done, there's a lot of levels in there that are approved that later on are found out that aggregate caused some other problem they weren't even looking for. But something you said earlier about the soils, I think there's, there's a misconception that today just because agriculture uses big equipment and it's, it's using techniques like GPS and all that, that somehow farming today is less sustainable than it used to be. And that's completely mis uh, a misconception. Farming today is much, much more sustainable than it ever was. And if you look at the soil health back in the 30s and even in the 80s, in the prairies, that topsoil, which is irreplaceable, was blowing away every year. And today, because of farming, mar modern farming practices, including the use of herbicides, which reduces the ability, which reduces the need for a farmer to till that soil, they're able to keep that cover on there. It doesn't blow away, it doesn't erode. You can't do that if you're not, if you're, if you're not using a herbicide. You, so there are trade-offs. But you used a word in there that's really dodgy called the word sustainable. Which Absolutely. is a I cycle. would argue I mean, that with anybody, yeah. that there's, there, and a, there's that strong profit, data that proves that. To be sustainable means that you just got paid. Everything that we're talking about right now has occurred in the last 100 years, essentially since Woodrow Wilson was president. Everything flipped. So to say that... Well, we're sure it's good now. It's, we don't know this. But also, just to your point, because I know you have an amazing restaurant in Toronto, and you said you buy more than just organics, right? So you probably have a market for very local. You have a lot of contact with your farmers. It's very different than what, say, the very average different. Canadian consumer can afford or put on their table, right? So Well, no. That's but I think there's a place for both of them. Like, I think just because um, you don't buy organics doesn't mean you're not doing the best for your family, but it doesn't mean that both of those systems can exist, right? There's a place for both of them. Okay, we need to take a short break. There's more when we come back, <laughs> so stay tuned. What I don't want parents to do is be fearful of feeding them their kids strawberries, sweet potatoes, because they can't afford the organic. thinking about how we can apply technology to transform food, and we start looking for all these new food products, but often it's right under our noses. When you look at how we grow broccoli, so this picture that you're looking at behind me right now is predominantly made up of leaves. All these leaves go to waste. The only product actually being consumed is that small head of broccoli in the middle. So what if we reimagine the things we grow in order to be more efficient and actually grow things that we eat? There are numerous projects that explore closed system farming. What if we move farming away from the fields and actually into the cities and start looking at how we can have modules right here downtown that will produce all the food that our communities need? Pushing a little further, what happens when we actually start culturing our food in the laboratory? One of the high-impact products that's being explored right now and has actually already been developed is lab-cultured milk. So what does it mean when you do away with a whole dairy farm and now you actually take all those individual proteins that make up milk and you grow them inside yeast? We're seeing a similar exploration in meat. So not only are we looking to shift our protein sources to insects or to plant-based proteins, we're also exploring what it means to grow a steak in the laboratory. Is this the same food that we've been eating till today? 
Welcome back. That was fu food futurist Dr. Erwin Adam at Moses Zneimer's Idea City. His work uses biotechnology to alter food's nutritional content, taste, and texture in order to meet the needs of the consumer. He says this is the future of food. And speaking of the future, the UN estimates the global population will reach 10 billion by 2050. And by some estimates, agricultural output will have to increase by 50% to feed all of those mouths. So is this achievable? Now, there's a lot to unpack in this segment. Um, I just want to start with you, sort of get your reaction to that video we just saw. Um, it's interesting because that's, it's so, I don't know, it's so superhero to watch that stuff. So uh, it's fascinating. I want to watch it. But it, but it is also, fascinating. I mean, if you can yeah. alter the texture, the nutritional content, doesn't that sound like a good thing? But how I realistic think a bunch is of the, it? The premises that he said, though, are weird. Like, you, you might throw the leaves from the broccoli away, but you don't fill a landfill with them, they go back in, in the compost, and it's, it's still there. It doesn't go anywhere. Paul. Well, I'm just, I, I look at these producing in labs, the, the segment there that showed that, and, you know, can they realistically produce enough food for a city within those little labs? And where, where, where are those results? And, and, and how realistic is, is that? For me, you've got to see the proof of that. Let's go back to sort of the, these key words we keep hearing, genetically engineered. What does that mean? So <clears throat> when we look at what plants look like today, food that we eat today versus what they looked like, you know, hundreds of years ago, things have changed quite a bit. So we've always been, for thousands of years, we've taken plants and we've bred them with one another to get the traits that we really wanted. It's a cumbersome process. We've even, we use radiation and chemicals too to, to affect the genetics of a seed and see what we get and grow them out and see after multiple generations, there's some that have the right taste attributes and, and growth attributes, we, we, we pick those ones and we uh, multiply those. What genetic engineering does is it speeds up that process. You basically know where on the gene the trait that you want is, and you either clip that out or you put in another gene that you want in that plant. And so it's, it's basically modern technology of something we've done for tens of thousands of years. Is there anyone at this table who thinks GMOs are unsafe? Sometimes. But sometimes, sometimes you, like we don't know where they're going to go. <laughs> that's the that's the question. I think that it's in my mind, anyhow. You know what what is going to happen down the road. You know. So they've been around for over twenty years now, yeah. and there's yeah. literally been trillions of meals of genetically engineered food I, I around the world. I suspect everyone in this audience and, has probably consumed. And, and there has oh, not sure. been a reportable incident re related to the genetic well, engineering. On a mass of scale, anyway. So. Except for that. Now, when, I think about, when I think about GMOs, when I, th I think about the consumer, because I'm a mom, and I was actually that mom 20, 15 years ago uh, that was anti-GMO, that was pro-organics, and that's all I wanted to feed my family. Guilty. Over the last two or three years, I've sort of done a deep dive into Canada's farming and how we grow things, and I have definitely changed my tune a little bit. What I don't think people understand that there's only actually, I think it's nine different crops that are genetically modified, right, for consumer consumption. If that. Yeah. If that. And the labels that we see in the grocery stores, so we all know that butterfly, it says non-GMO. Mm -hmm. th that's on products that wouldn't even have a genetically modified ingredient in it. So we're seeing it on, I don't know, bread, for instance. So wheat is one of the, you know, hot topics. People are anti-wheat, they're gluten-free. But there's actually no GMO wheat for sale in the consumer market. So my question is, why are we allowed in Canada to put a label on something where a similar product does not exist where that GMO wheat exists. I know the answer to that. The yes, answer is marketing is... Yes, well, but, but, and I but think that's, that's what... It is, I agree, but that's all, the, that's all the consumer sees, right? And as a mom who's like, okay, that's not GMO, that must be a bad thing. Right. It's not, we don't have the time as moms. You know, I've been in the food industry, industry for many years, and I've done a lot of research, and it's still really confusing, and it's not a black and white issue. But what I don't want parents to do is be fearful of feeding their, their kids strawberries, sweet potatoes, because they can't afford the organic or non-GMO uh, option. But by 2050, there will be, estimates say there will be uh, 10 billion people on this planet. Can we feed those 10 billion without technology? Can we sustain it on an organic diet? Must, I mean, are GMOs the only panacea for world hunger? But we're not feeding the population now either, and it's much more of a political, economical yes. issue. It's not only a farming issue, but to your point, we spoke earlier about organics, and organics take a lot more 
um, land to farm. You need a lot more land to farm organics to get the same yield you would in a conventional. In the larger, I know Brad is shaking his head at me, and that's okay. Well, you're not that's entirely wrong. wrong. No, but I'm, but but I'm also, talking on large scale worse. corporate like organics. Marketing. Oh, no, but I'm saying large scale organics, right? I mean, these aren't tiny mom and pop shops anymore. You use the word panacea. I mean, I wouldn't argue that the technology is that are being produced today or that are coming down the road will be the panacea. It's going to be a, a number of things. The, the places in the world that are going to experience the most population growth are the ones who can least afford to have more. They, they just don't have the arable land to, to, to grow more food. And so that's going to have to come from somewhere. And Canada, we're very fortunate. We've got a small population and a tremendous agricultural land base. And we have a role to play in feeding the world. And new technologies, current and new, um, can and will have a, a tremendous role to play in, the, in those markets. And, but I, I'm also thinking, you know, as Canadians, uh, we're very privileged to make to be able to make these choices. Um, you know, GMOs isn't just something that we're thinking in our little bubble. So when you look outside of our own country, you think about like the Hawaiian papaya, or you think about a mother in Africa who's trying to farm bananas, who there's, um, you know, fungus in her. If she can't have access to this technology, she can't feed her family. It's not about me going to Whole Foods and my Lululemons, buying my kale that's organic. It's not about that. It's a bigger issue, and I think people forget that. You have to step outside your little bubble and think larger. All right, when we come back, why caring for bees will boost our planet's hopes of survival. Stay tuned. Fifty thousand uh, bees in here. Most of them are girls. Who, who does the work in the house? All the women. Welcome back. Honey bees are a vital part of our natural environment. They pollinate approximately 70% of the world's crops. Without honey bees, our grocery stores would be near empty. John Kaufman from the Urban Toronto Beekeepers Association joins me now to discuss the importance of bee health to sustainable food production and for advice on how to raise honey bees. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah. How important is it that we wear these, these full suits every time we handle honey bees? Well, I think when you start off, it's a good idea because it gives you a lot of confidence. You don't have to worry about uh, being stung and, and there's 50, 60,000 bees in a hive and you get them all buzzing around you and you just feel a lot more confident. I, I started off wearing a, a full suit like that and then the gloves and all. But now I just go out and I, when we go to the bee yard, I just wear a veil. I, I don't wear gloves anymore. Because I 50, 60,000 bees, yeah. I mean, th their natural in, instinct would be to protect themselves and perhaps sting you if you're coming close to them. How could they're, you? They're busy. They're busy. They're, they've got other things on their mind. They don't want to sting you uh, <laughs> because if they sting you, they die. So it's a, it's a real... Uh, it's, it's a real threat. They probably yeah. sense you're a friend of the bees. I hope they do. Now, what yeah. have we got here? Okay, well, this is a, a typical beehive. This is what most commercial beekeepers would have. This is Langstroth hive. It was invented in the 1980s by uh, Reverend uh, Langstroth in the States. And it became a, the, the standard for all beekeepers because uh, it has what they call movable frames inside. And you can also inspect these hives for uh, disease and uh, pests that might be inside. So this okay. is another component to yeah, there before we sort two, of break this whole thing down. Two vital uh, important instruments. First one is uh, what we call a hive tool. It's just sort of a, a pry bar, uh, very sharp edges, and a, and a smoker. Now, what is this? What's the okay. smoke? The smoke, we, we would just put some burlap and some uh, wood shavings inside here, get a little fire going, and put some damp leaves on top to, so it's a cool smoke that comes out, not a hot, you don't want to burn the bees. And it's just the smoke uh, calms the bees down. Uh, there's a couple of theories about what it does. One theory is that it masks the, uh, the pheromones, the way they communicate and so they cannot communicate as well. Another theory is that uh, the bees think there's a fire, and so they start eating honey, and, uh, and you know what happens after you've eaten, eaten a big meal? You get slowed down, you want to relax and lie down and sleep. So it keeps them a little calmer. And we first, the first we, we come to the hive, we would talk to them and say, hello, we're here. Um, we uh, hope uh, don't do, they, do they respond? Um, <laughs> I hope they do. Um, traditionally, if you've had a death in the family or something's happened, the tradition is to tell the bees. And uh, the bees are supposed to be communicating, uh, not just among themselves, but uh, it's with the universe. So first of all, we come to the, the hive, you smoke a little bit, smoke them, and let you know there. Then we take our hive tool to, to open it up. Okay. So we're going to take this apart, like as if I was going to inspect the hive. First of all, I take off, this wouldn't be glued down. I would take off the lid, 
the outer cover. And we use that to put, put the, the hive uh, parts on because we don't want to put them on the ground and get them dirty. So this part here is a, it's called a quilt box. This is something we use, and not all beekeepers do, but we find this really helpful because in the summertime, we f well, we fill it with a straw and, or uh, shredded paper. In the summertime, it acts as insula insulation. In the wintertime, it absorbs the moisture from the hive. Now, this is where the bees live. Yeah, the bees will be living in here, and there are two sizes of the boxes. You see the, the larger one and the smaller one. The smaller one is called a honey super. That's where the honey uh, would be uh, that we would take off. And it's smaller because it's easier to lift. This would probably weigh 60 pounds or so, and if you've got them piled up three or four high, it's pretty hard to lift down, especially when you're an old guy like me. So Just look inside. I'm going to take this down right now. Uh, I'll have to crack it open. <clears throat> There'll be our big crack. And then you move that over here. And we'll go, we'll go into that later. Now, this is called a brood box. This is where the, the bees uh, have their babies. And um, this is the frame here. Uh, let's see. I should take this, like, tilt this a bit so you can see it out there. Maybe I can That's, pull this frame out. Yeah. Those are the those are frames or eight frames in here. Now this is a clean frame before the honey yep. the That's honey bees. Yep. We would put this in with just like that, and the bees would will be working away and they'll build that up. And I'll show you what they do. Here is a that's a pretty ready ratchet one, but uh, they build that all themselves. That's wax, beeswax. That's the stuff you use beeswax candles or whatever you, you make different things out of it. But the bees make this from their body. They uh, will um, extrude little flakes of wax from their abdomen and chew it together, and they'll build this perfect little hexagonal frame, and they'll fill this up in probably uh, a week if it's a good flow of And the other uh, thing nectar. that's really neat is it's shaped like a heart. Yeah. And it's always shaped like a heart, isn't it? Yeah, it always is, because they, what they do when they build this is they hang uh, just like uh, hang on each other, and so they hang in this necklace-like shape, and so they're building this comb. And it's always a, this hexagonal shape. This is where all the, the babies are born. This is where the uh, honey is laid as well, made as well. And then this is what you're looking for when you're opening up the hive. You're looking for a, a nice patch of brood. This will be a good, strong, healthy hive. This is brood. That's where the babies are born. There's one right there, just chewing our way out. Uh, oh, by the way, these are all girls. Who, who does the work in the house? All the women. <laughs> 50,000 uh, bees in here, most of them are girls. Um, the boys, the, the drones, they would just hang out uh, for a little while. All they want, they come along, they want to be fed. That's the way it is, yep. Uh, so these are the babies here, honey around the outside. So when the babies are born, boom, they got breakfast ready. Um, and you're looking for that kind of a pattern. And also you're looking for... The queen. The queen, she is the mother of all of these bees, so 50 or 60,000 of her daughters. And this one is uh, marked with a, a blue dot. Some beekeepers will mark their bees so they know the year she was born. Every year has a different color. But you're always looking for the queen, because if you don't have a queen, your hive is gone. Okay, so then, so let's talk about, yeah. you know, the final product. Okay. So you've got all of these bees, yep. they're, working, they're, they're working toward making honey. Yep. They eat the honey that's down in here, yep. and then this honey is for, that's is that what, for us? That's what we steal. Got it. We steal it from them. Actually, they build, they make enough uh, honey for themselves. They overproduce. They, they, they overproduce. They're overproducers. This is the honey frame, and that's full of honey. And, and how would you extract that honey? How you would take a sharp knife and scrape that layer of wax off the top and in and both sides and you put it in a centrifuge and it spins it around and throws the honey out. Feel that for weight. Just Does it wait? And what's neat too is is these these contraptions are they're recyclable. Like oh, they yes. reuse them. Yeah, this is one that's been spun out and the honey's all out of that. So we can just put that back in, and the bees will fill that up, clean it all up, and make sure it's all They'll ready to go. All and right. Recycling. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you so yeah. much for this. When we come back, expert gardening advice for growing your own root vegetables. Stick around. Then we will take our seed potatoes here with the eye facing up putting basically about three, that's all. Out of bins like this, we've got up to two pounds of sweet fingerling potatoes.
you live in the city, you maintain a busy work schedule, and you constantly find yourself looking for healthy food options on the go, but all you find are fast food joints. Do you have a cheat day, or do you visit an a and and get what they're serving called the Beyond Meat Burger, based entirely off of plants? Is it any good? I have no idea, but I've been given this very interesting assignment to find out. Hi there, can I get a Beyond Meat Burger? Thank you. Okay, so we've just come from the drive-thru and I've picked up two burgers. I've picked up a Mama Burger and a Beyond Meat Burger just so I can get a little bit of the comparison. Full disclosure, my dad has actually been a very successful and reputable butcher in the city of Toronto for over four decades. So my taste of meat is kind of uh, beyond, let's say, that of the average uh, consumer. I'm hoping that won't play any bias here. I'm gonna start with the Mama Burger for an affordable cheap burger. This isn't bad. It's not taking my breath away <laughs> or by any means. Now, I'm really curious to see what this Beyond Meat burger is all about. It doesn't taste traditionally like a patty would to me, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. As far as substitutes go for me, this is pretty good. So a and on their website is proudly advertising some of the ingredients that come within the Beyond Meat Burger. Beets to give it the color and vitamins, uh, as well as yellow peas for some of the protein. So I definitely wasn't expecting a meat flavor. It's more flavorful, I think, than the Mama Burger. There you have it. The son of a butcher man is admitting that the Beyond Meat Burger is better than the original Mama Burger. I do think a plant-based patty actually has more aroma, more flavor than the original Mama Burger did. Check out the Beyond Meat Burger. It's pretty awesome. Thank you, Sean, for that. Now, the best way to know exactly where your food comes from is to grow it yourself. Root crops are easy to grow, but they're not without their quirks. Paul Zamet from Toronto Botanical Gardens joins me now with tips on growing a successful harvest of all sorts of root vegetables. And we're going to start with the potato. Thanks for being here, by Thank the way. Thank you for having me. I have to say, I, you know, growing root vegetables can be pretty daunting because you really need to start out right because once you pull it up, there's no turning back. That's correct. So really key is starting off with the right ingredients. You know, making sure you got the light for the potatoes, the right container mix, and starting off with the right material. So in this case, we're starting with seed potatoes. And most people think when you think seed, you think of these little packages. Sure. It's not. It's an actual potato. They come in a package that looks a little bit something like that. And they'll, they'll be seed. marked as organic or inorganic, making your choices. I think it's very important about choices. And what's really important to get them going is make sure you sprout your potatoes, putting them in a bright uh, light location to get these wonderful sprouts. And these are what are referred to as eyes. And then what you'll do is you take a nice sharp knife and you actually want to cut your potatoes as such because you want to get a nice about two inches of the potato with each of the eyes. And in this case here, where you've got multiple eyes, like four, I would leave maybe only about three. Okay. okay. And then what you want to do is you actually want to let them sit and callous in a bright light location. Inside? Inside. And what happens is you can see they kind of have shriveled a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. That's creating like a little bit of scab, like when you get hurt, so that when you're actually planting them, they don't rot. Now, how long does that take to shrivel? Uh, usually it's about three days. Okay. I have to admit, we've sometimes done it in shorter when you're in a real pinch. So what then you need is your container. And the key with potatoes is you want them quite deep because as they grow, you cover them with your container mix. So in this case here, we can use this large container here. And notice we've only put a little bit of soil down in the bottom. That's not much. We actually at the Toronto Botanical Garden like to use things like recycling bins because they're convenient. We have them uh, and, and based on their shape as well. So I'm just going to take some of the container mix here, fill that in, and then really I just want to create a base of about three inches. Give that a little bit of a settle. Oh, there's nothing like feeling the earth, and there's all sorts of benefits for getting your hands dirty. Then we will take our sweet potatoes here with the eye facing up. And in this size of a bin right here, putting basically about three. That's all. That's it. Okay. And will they grow to just three full-grown potatoes? Oh, no. Out of bins like this, we've gone up to two pounds of sweet fingerling potatoes out of one bin. How does that? I mean, they don't look like seeds, so it, it, it's, it's hard to It's just a imagine. term for them. And so what we would do then is give them a cover-up. And all we're doing is just covering just above the eyes because they will sense the light and begin to grow through that. And then when the shoots get to about four to six inches, we're adding more of the container mix and continuing to add till eventually the plants come up, they will flower. And then the sad part most people think is because they start to turn yellow and you're not a bad gardener. That is what they do. Once they're beginning yellowing, they're beginning to ripen. And at that point you can stop watering 
and you can get ready to harvest. How much water does this require? Something of this size here, I'd say a couple of liters, but checking that per every day? two to three days. Okay. No, you don't want potatoes to sit in water because they will rot. Got it, got it. A nice bright six to eight hours of sunlight. And from start to finish, you know, how long would it take for the potato to be ready to Depending harvest? Depending on the type of potato, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. So even if you're selecting ones that are shorter and longer, you can extend the harvest. And I have to admit, I've actually done a little bit of digging. You've, it's like a treasure hunt and you'll find them and collect a few even before or the, the whole thing is ready. Okay, now let's move on to, you've got, I see you've got some parsley here, some other different types of, of edible plants. When we, when we talk about adding edibles, sometimes, you know, and, and this is what I want people to connect back to the garden and the power of gardening. We often do things just for us, but when we're adding edibles to the garden, there's some, for example, parsley, one of my all-time favorite plants. It's amazing because not only is it great for you, all sorts of anti-cancer and fighting properties, you can use it in floral design, great garnish, but it also helps to attract swallowtail butterflies to the garden. And to me, when we are planting a garden, it's about creating this balance, creating, bringing in other insects as well that often feed on other insects, and that helps to give you biological control, such as hoverflies. They lay eggs and their larvae eat aphids, which are often a pest for us. Sure. So inviting them into the garden, and that creates a wonderful balance. And again, in all, sort of an all-natural way yes. to, to go about growing. I will typically put parsley in almost any planters I do. Even if it's full of ornamentals, add a little bit of parsley. It messes with people's minds because they recognize it, but it's like, what's it doing in there? And why not? Grow food where you can. And it smells so good. It does. All right. It does. And what have we got down here? So in this case here, one thing that I often do is, you know, when going to visit people, you want to take a bottle of wine, and I'm not quite the wine drinker. I don't know wines very well, nor my wife or I, and I like things to be a little bit personal. So what I've started doing is actually edible bouquets, taking things I out of the garden. I love that idea. I love it. And giving someone an edible bouquet. So in this case here, we'll take dahlias. Dahlias, which are edible. You can eat both the tubers and the petals. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a little bit of flour, okay, adding a little bit of flour. And these are kind of semi-double ones, which are suitable for the bees. And they're so we'll pretty. We'll take a little bit of our kale. Oh, we got a nice big chunk of kale here. And again, I will do this usually in midsummer. Um, just, it just adds that wonderful personal touch. I love all about texture, so mixing things like the kales together. Another plant that you can grow quite easily in the garden is stalks. You can grow that from seed. Their flowers are also edible. So just very quickly, it just adds that personal touch. It came from your garden. Oh, you can smell the stalks. They're so fragrant. How about another dahlia inside there? And no worries about the dahlias because when you do that to them, they actually will side branch and produce more flowers for you. Oh, that's neat. And then my favorite Last is one. always a little bit of rosemary. Oh, it smells so Isn't good. Isn't it incredible? The whole room is just so fragrant with the rosemary. You can grow this inside, can't you? Yes, you can. This plant is about eight years old. So I'm going to share a little bit of rosemary. And to me, you know, fragrance is such an important thing. Uh, as soon as I smell rosemary, I'm transported to Malta where I was born because it grows in the streets. I have wonderful memories of picking rosemary with my grandma, my nana, and there we go. And Look at everything that. that I'm giving you here, once I've got it done, will be edible. Whoops. One more. And there you go. An edible bouquet Pumat? just for you from our garden. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> All right, we need to take a short break. We'll see you on the other side. There's a whole new revolution coming called gene editing. They've been able to find the gene where, that causes browning, so for apples, and they just silence it. Welcome back, it's time for questions from our audience. And now we're going to start with Jane. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my question is very simple. Should we just not buy any product that says made in China? You don't see a lot of produce made in China, but garlic comes. Garlic can come yeah. from. And I typically, I'm, I, I typically buy my garlic from California. So, but uh, for that very reason, because I'm afraid <laughs> that it's made in China. Go ahead. So uh, one of the things that we do get a lot of from China is apple juice. A lot of apple juice is made from apples in China. And th the interesting thing to me is that um, the Chinese people aren't that particularly interested in eating their own food. They, they will pay huge premiums to have Canadian food. 
And so I'm, what really astounds me is that Canadians aren't more impressed with our own food compared to the Chinese. Yes. Uh, yes. Talking about garlic, I mean, garlic, you can go to a farmer's market and they're, they're overflowing with garlic. I saw, I talked to a farmer last weekend uh, and uh, she just said too much garlic. She didn't know what, she was doing all sorts of other new things with it. The, the thing that surprises me too is that the, the variety, you know, like you can get 15 different varieties of garlic in a farmer's market, you know. One of, the, <laughs> one of the reasons for that is that the, and, and you know, the Chinese garlic always looks so good. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons for that is they radiate it. So they actually radiate it so to prevent disease from infecting it. So, so that's a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. So I, my answer, short answer would be, no, I wouldn't. But don't no, you, think, you wouldn't. I do I think we are getting better. I mean, for a long period, there was all about this perfection and, and how our foods looked. And I think we've really come a long way that things don't have to be perfect. I mean, harvest something from your garden. How often is it perfect? But it tastes fabulous. All right. Thanks, Jane. My name is Sonia, and my question is, is there any scientific proof that gen uh, genetically modified food is bad for you? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Did um, you pay her? No, <laughs> no we don't know each other. Um, that's, a, that's a great question, and, and there's a lot of misinformation on the internet uh, circulating, not just about GMOs, but about pesticides, and, and the reality is, we have to have some sort of impartial body that we can refer to. Same with vaccines, right? There's all kinds of misinformation about vaccines, but we rely on Health Canada to say, no, these vaccines are safe and they prevent you know, significant disease. On, on GMOs, like I said, there's years and years of research behind it and several years of, uh, of approvals at Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency before they ever make it to the market. And the other thing is that genetic engineering, as we call it, and GMOs, there's a whole new revolution coming in that space called gene editing, which is even more precise than GMOs. It doesn't use any foreign DNA. It's just the plant's DNA where you say, okay, this, this part of the gene causes browning. So for apples, when you slice them open, they turn brown within minutes sometimes. They've been able to find the gene where, that causes that oxidation, and they just silence it. So they don't introduce anything foreign. They just silence that part of the gene that causes oxidation. And now your apples can stay open, cut open, you can slice them for your kid's lunch, and there's, you know, back to food waste issue, this is a very practical uh, solution using a new technique. How do you feel about <laughs> gene silencing? <laughs> I mean, it changes what it is, so I mean, if it's not browning, it's also not breaking down the same way out there, it's not necessarily breaking down the same way in your gut. What is it you need to do to an apple that you can't just... I've watched in grocery stores, you know, they peel an orange and then they put it in a container. And I always go, it came in a container. Why did you take it off and put in a new one? I actually agree with you on this point because to me, as much as I embrace some of the technology as someone who cooks for a living, like, yeah, apples brown and like, so what if your apple browns? It's part of what happens. So some of this stuff to me is a little bit confusing, but I also find it interesting that as, a, as, a, as humanity who embraces so much technology, we have such a hard time embracing new food technology, right? I understand being trepidatious and asking the questions. It's important. We need to do those things, but I think the technology is really cool, and I think it'll take us a lot farther than we think. Okay, thanks for your question. When we come back, final thoughts. In a previous episode, we discussed home sharing. On Facebook, Catherine writes, the city of Toronto is getting more and more expensive to live in. It almost seems like a no-brainer to co-rent or co-own property. In another episode of The Zoomer, we spoke about downsizing. Matthew tweeted, as much as I love the place I called home for 35 years, I knew I was getting too old to keep up with the amount of maintenance my house needed. Downsizing was the right move. Hashtag downsizing. Keep the comments coming in and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and via email at rsvp at zoomermedia.ca. Don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media. And log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more.
Welcome back. Our panelists will leave us with their final thoughts. And we'll start to my left. Brad. Thank you. Um, I think the solution to a lot of what we're talking about is really to teach um, everybody more about food. So, you know, we would be doing early childhood education, you're talking grade three, four, or five, just basic stuff, how you boil water, what, where food comes from, and, and how you cook simple meals. It's not about organic or not. It's about eating really good food. Don't eat wads of bad things. You don't need sugar in huge quantities, but have candy, enjoy life. It's just, it's just so not complicated if you just appreciate a good meal. So I think it's really important that we try to find foods that are back to the basics. So eating fresh fruits and vegetables is, is a, a primary, should be a primary goal. Uh, whole grains, the, the, the closer it is to its, uh, its natural state, the better. And uh, avoiding highly processed foods with the MSGs and so on and so forth. My mind would be, you know, be careful of the information that's out there. There's a lot of information sorting it out. But learn the, the power of your choices and learn that by growing something, you have a lot more control, not only what's in your food, but the effect that it has on you. And we see that on a regular basis. So I would say, everyone, get gardening. Grow something that you can eat. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I would come back to the whole idea that 70% uh, of what you eat is being uh, pollinated by uh, insects, not just honeybees. The honeybees are only a small portion of that. And everybody asks, are, are bees in trouble? And they, uh, and they, they imagine uh, honeybees. And honeybees aren't in trouble, because we can, we can get new bees and bring them in. It's like, it's a, like a farm animal. The ones that are really in trouble, are, and it really makes me sad, is the, uh, the native bees. The native, little native bees that live in your garden. So if you clean up your garden, don't rake your, uh, your leaves out too soon. Don't leave a lot of garbage in your gar garden. That, that's where the little bees live. They live in those stalks of, uh, of um, raspberry canes and things like that. And if you throw them out, you're probably throwing out a whole generation of bees. Uh, I think what I want people to know is be a critical thinker. Don't take everything that you see for face value. And know, um, as Canadians, you know, it's amazing to have all the choices that we have. Um, but Canadians and parents specifically need to feel good about the choices that they're making in the grocery store. So do so with an open mind, uh, with an educated mind. And, uh, you know, just feed your family and cook. Let's get back to cooking for our family. That's the bottom line. Yeah, my main message would be that, you know, Canada, we're very fortunate. We've got a very uh, sustainable and, and, and productive agriculture system. And I think people should focus more on eating a balanced diet, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, than worrying about whether or not the production system was organic or not. And that, that's the, the main message. We know we can improve health outcomes by, uh, by eating more fruits and vegetables. All right. Well, on that note, that's all the time we have. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.